this is really weird for me talking. Roger and I are <coughs> giving a presentation between us. I've never given a joint presentation before. Um, I think when Morton and Gita asked us to do it, she had Laurel and Hardy in mind. <laughs> and um, uh, I used to work with a German computer engineer. This must be a phrase in German. And whenever things were going wrong, he would say, I see black. <laughs> and uh, that, that's the feeling I, I see. Flat, I have a feeling. So this is this is my part. Right, I, I think Roger's part is good. My part is desperately thin. I'm relying on native wit and charm <laughs> to get to get me through this bit. <clears throat> the other thing is I forbade Flora to come into the room at the back. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> That's, that's got an inhibiting effect on me. And, and a final thing why this can't possibly work is the, um, we chose the title of what is functional programming um, and that's actually a subject that's very dear to me. It's like a, a you know, religious uh, um, part of me so I cannot make fun of it. So the, the, the whole thing is doomed. Um, so what I, the, way, the way this is going to work um, I'm the, I'm the warm-up guy for um, Roger. Roger has got a nice... Uh, put the pressure on Roger. Roger's got a nice presentation. So what I'm hoping is... Um, you'll forget my bit and remember Roger's bit. And anyway, our saving grace is that what follows this is drinking. So this time tomorrow, <laughs> nobody will remember. So this is really... I, I took this very seriously. So... <clears throat> You could, you could look on this as surrealistic humour, but there is actually no humour in this. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go very straight, po-faced kind of um, <clears throat> thing. So th this, really, no, this really is serious. Um, so the, uh, this is a <clears throat> one man's view of a taxonomy of programming languages. Uh, honestly, this is, uh, this is not a joke. This is, uh, uh, this is what I truly believe. So I think we can... <clears throat> uh, this is just one week. Uh, we can divide computer programming languages into procedural and declarative languages, of which... Within procedural languages, we have classic languages such as Fortran, Basic, COBOL, C, and traditional APL. These are procedural languages. The, this talk is about functional languages, so we'll come to those in a moment. <clears throat> and procedural languages developed, um, and one of the subclasses of procedural languages are languages that represent state. So with some programming, you need to represent state. And the object-oriented languages are the state-of-the-art um, uh, uh, examples of procedural languages. So if you want to represent state, if you're doing modelling, or you want to represent um, uh, real-life situations, that you, you would go in that direction. The declarative languages... This is my, the astute amongst you, well, this is my homemade PowerPoint. It's actually an edit window, and I've cut and pasted these things, um, so all I'm doing is screening down. It took, took me, a, it would have been a lot easier to learn to use PowerPoint, but... Uh, um, so declarative languages break down into... Uh, what a declarative language is, is a, with a procedural language, you tell a computer what you want to do. First do this then do this, and this is how you do this bit, and this is how you do this bit. With a declarative language, you just declare what you want. You say, this is what I want, and uh, you leave the machine to do the hard work. So the very early examples of this were logic programming languages like Prolog. So the, the computer was doing the tricky stuff. Um, then there's some interesting systems um, called term rewrite languages, which... Uh, they, they seem to be a new... Uh, well, there's a fair amount of uh, newish literature written about them, and they are things like symbolic manipulation languages. Um, 
equation reduction, <laughs> equation solving languages. And there's a little plug. One of the supplied um, uh, workspaces in Dialog is called eval.dws, and that's an example of a term rewrite system where you can write rules and the, uh, the machine will... Um, that's, a, that's an example of that. And then the ones that are closest to my heart are functional languages. And the forerunner in those, the one that everybody knows about as a functional language is Haskell. That's the, um, all the academics um, uh, use Haskell as an example of uh, functional languages. But other examples are, there's again a little plug, there's a, a trivial workspace we supply called maxd.ws, which is a, a trivial but fully paid up functional language. So if you really want to know what a functional language is, that's an, you could look in there and that will uh, give you, it's the minimum language that can be described as a functional language. In fact, sexier than a functional language, it's a lazy functional language, and that's the purest of the pure things, purest of the pure. And then the final one is, um, well, I like to say, nicely written defuns. Uh, defuns can be used as an example of a functional language. So if you avoid using side effects, uh, defuns help you to write languages. Uh, now I've got to do this. I'm going to switch my... Right. So that's a taxonomy. Um, so what are, what are the plus points of functional programming? If you, if you look in... Um, for a long time, I was interested in functional programming since the mid to late 80s, and uh, it was really hard to get a definition. If you looked up... If you asked somebody what functional programming language was they'd say it's a programming language in which you use functions, or it's a functiony kind of language. It's very hard to get a definition. But a number of things, the academics agree uh, that a number of the uh, points you often find in uh, functional language. One is called referential transparency, and this is a very obscure way of saying the result of a function depends on only on its inputs and not on any <clears throat> external um, uh, external event. It doesn't do side effects. And effectively, you can replace a function and its arguments with the result at any point. There's no um, tran th there's no progression of things going on. It's not like, a, a, for instance, a function that tells you what time it is is not a functional program because every time you call it, you get a different uh, answer. So that's a, that's a very important part of um, functional programming. Uh, the second thing is functions as first-class citizens. In traditional APL or, or early APLs, um, arrays were the first-class citizens. Everything in APL is an array. Um, but latterly, um, we have operators, and in newer APLs, um, defined operators, which take functions as arguments, and you can contrive to produce um, functions as results. Uh, uh, and an example of this is the... This is a plug for, I'm going to be talking about revisiting the experiment we did with closures uh, where fun uh, <coughs> uh, functions can return functions. So they become... Um, uh, uh, just They can be used as arguments and returned as results. I was frightened to death. I saw somebody was asking a question, but, but no. Um, the, the, the next... Oh, goodness. Uh, this is a Mac, actually, running a, a Windows VM, and it's uh, every time you go near a Mac, strange things happen. Um, the other, the, the, one of the other points is functional decomposition, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, these are all very posh words for simple concepts and functional decomposition um, is a way of saying taking a problem and split it into functions and then the functions can be recombined to solve the original problem and I'll show you that uh, another way of doing these things would be to decompose the arrays and chop the problem up into two but chopping, uh, chopping problems into uh, functions and composing them again is what um, uh, <coughs> a functional programmer's done. And an example of that um, is to uh, <coughs> uh, decomposing functions and composing them up again 
is to create a domain-specific language. And an example of that is where you build, you use functions to build verbs, uh, specific uh, functions that are specific to the problem area that you're working in. So effectively, you are defining your own language to solve your particular problem. And that is, again, um, and then you combine these functions, you recompose them. OK, I told you that was, this is thin. So that's my sort of in, uh, lead up introduction. Now Roger's going to tell you stuff, and then you get another dose of me in a moment. <clears throat> so I'm just going to unplug that, Roger. Uh, your body of liquid. Oh, yeah, that's out of, out of harm's way. Yeah. <clears throat> John and I compared our notes for the first time on Sunday. <laughs> I was uh, astonished, uh, and, but gratified to discover that two people who have worked together for years, when given the same topic, can have presentations that are so different. <laughs> so here goes. So this is a quote from Howard Aiken, who's the thesis advisor for Ken Iverson. So if Ken is the father of APL in, in a real sense, Howard Aiken is the grandfather of APL. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not intending to give a definition of functional programming. These are just random thoughts. <coughs> so what functional programming does is it specifies how, component, how components combine. In other words, rules for the interface between components. And such rules are necessary because errors tend to happen in the interface. So I just want to point out that <coughs> functional programming is not some uh, ivory tower or academic uh, exercise only. It's actually used in real life, and you have been using it all your life, probably. Uh, so the, the d fun f g of omega or f composed of g is like a Unix pipe. Now, the difference is that Unix pipes are connected via standard in and standard out. And APL functions are connected via array arguments and array results. So, and we know that arrays are much richer than standard in and standard out. So it should be more powerful. I'll illustrate the concepts with an example. Now, John described this example during breakfast at the Minerval Conference two weeks ago. He says that in the early days, Al Rose, who was an APL pioneer, went on tours giving talks in APL. And in London, he told the audience, I have the text of the Psalms in my computer. Uh, ask me any question you like. And the question from the audience was, find the most frequently occurring word in the song. John says, Al's quiet showman. So we did this, stay silent for a minute. And then he started typing, typing out the answer and got the solution. So when John finished the story, I asked him, has it been a minute yet? Because I have a solution in jail. So what this is doing is it's, it's doing
sort them on key applied to the fork tally linked with first, duplicate it, and tokenizing T, or word formation on T. And there's the answer. The most frequently occurring word in Psalms was D. I could have guessed that without writing a program. <laughs> <laughs> but this is proof. And uh, anything underneath? Oh, yes. So it, uh, the key thing that's used is the, this operator called key. And there more, there's more uh, substantive uh, description of it in the JWiki essay called key. So what, are the, what does that look like in APL, <coughs> or in dialog APL? First symbol, slash colon, is grayed down. And then the tilde is just duplicate. And now you have the possibility of forks in, in uh, dialog as well. You don't yet, yet have the key operator. Again, tilde is the uh, duplicate. And this is word formation or tokenizing. Now, you can't just uh, replace uh, gray down with just gray down commute or, or duplicate, because gray down has a dyadic meaning, which is not very convenient. So you have to do this more complicated thing. But it's basically sorting down um, and close array. And then the key operator can be uh, simply defined. So a minute to define, but a, a year to do well, to implement well. Anyway, the, the key operator defined as a D op, and then a simple uh, word or tokenizer, and the final solution. Sort down on the key thing using this function. So this is getting a count on the first. So a count and a word, right, of each uh, uh, you know, of the words grouped by distinct occurrences of words and, and counts. So <coughs> getting the same result. And in dialogue, you have the, another possibility of uh, constructing this function, which is this, compose of this, compose of that. And a handy little fork that you can do now in the conference edition, a fork that compares version 1 or version 0 to version 1 and getting the same answer. Um, I asked my colleague Joey Tuttle, long-time EPL and J programmer, to solve this problem using Unix pipes. And he reports that the J solution is faster than the Unix pipe solution by a factor of 60. So, okay. yep. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is to show you an example that compares uh, a declarative functional programming with a procedural uh, program. And I trawled through the... the um, <coughs> this was a really strange exercise for me because I was brought up as a procedural programmer 
and I've spent the last 20 years or so trying to get out of that and put it behind me and try to be a functional programmer. And um, I was looking through the Defense workspace to find an example of a little program that could, would look good in uh, the procedural and functional style. Um, and it's quite hard to find something. Um, but what I've come up with is uh, a program to remove comments. There's a, there's a Defense to remove comments. And I'd like to show you that written in both procedural and functional styles. So this is a, um, a Tradfern, and it does two things. It, ta take, it takes a line of APL and removes trailing comments. Uh, oh, does, a th does this work? What does this do? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is a Tradfern. It, it's given a line of APL. Um, and it's going, to, it's going to remove comments and return a result. And the, the only tricky thing is if we look at, say we had a line like this middle line, 3, and we wanted to remove the comment, we can't just look for the lamp symbol because it may be quoted. So I wouldn't want to, if I was removing the comments from this line, I'd want to start from there to the right, not from here to the right. That's the only trickiness in this. And then as an encore, um, having removed these comments, I'm going to remove training blanks after them. So, for instance, for this line, the result would start with the M of mask and end with the E of line. So this is a, this is a trad fun to, um, <clears throat> to do this job. And what I'd like to point out is a couple, of, um, <clears throat> a couple of things here. One of the things this is doing is developing arrays, uh, te some temporary, I've got some temporary... Um, names here, one of which is, is a function, but mask and temp are temporary arrays. So the, the, the first line is making, um, it's doing a not equal scan to find um, the, uh, sorry, this should be quoted, there's an error bug in my program, a mask of quoted characters, not commented characters. Um, so this switches noughts and ones on and off, uh, it switches the uh, notes on and off as it goes into a quoted line. And then if I use that to squish the line and expand it again, um, what that's going to do is leave blanks where, the, um, where any commented characters were. It's, it's also going to take one of the quotes with it. But, sorry, the quoted characters. Um, but we don't care. Okay, so this is a... a um, uh, so this is going to be a, a reproduction of the line, but ignoring the quoted, uh, any quoted uh, characters in there. And then uh, this guy is going to take the original line and replace it with um, the, the first, uh, when it finds the, uh, all up to the first non-quoted comment. And it's, uh, so the line, what's happening here is the line is, um, the line is replaced with... Uh, this, this stripped one, yeah? And then this last little thing, this is an idiom. This is almost like a primitive function that removes... Uh, this removes leading blanks. So what I can do here is reverse the line, remove the leading blanks from the reverse, reverse it back again and overwrite line with it. And this is typical of a, a procedural way of thinking. Effectively, I'm developing a vector. I'm overwriting it with successive... Uh, um, uh, so, <clears throat> I'm refining it and changing it and changing it. And whatever's, as we know with a trad firm, what is, whatever's left at the end when I fall off the bottom of the function is the, um, is the result there. And one of the things that's interesting is, <clears throat> um, this is a, a, a pet, um, uh, is it a bet noir, a bet blanc of mine, is that the, uh, the way you comment your function is indicative of your inner mental state. Um, <clears throat> so this is sort of um, psychiatry applied to uh, programming. What you'll notice is, uh, and I, I've cheated because I deliberately did this, but what this function does is it removes comments from a line. Um, I've got a mask of commented uh, characters. Excuse me. Um, now what I'm going to do is blank out the quoted vectors, I'm going to remove comments from the line, and then this is an idiom that removes leading blanks, and then I'm going to remove 
the trailing blanks from the line and that's it. What you'll notice is most of these comments are, um, uh, what are they, imperative sentences. They're saying do this, remove comments from the line, uh, blank out things. They're talking about uh, mutating a vector, do this to the vector, do that to the vector. And what I'd like to do now is to... Um, Oh, sorry, let me just show you that working. Let me try. I should have tested it before I describe. Let's see if it works. So what this is going to do is to... Um, it's going to take the quad CR of uh, Rumcum, make it into a vector of vectors, Rumcum each of them, and uh, split it back into a make. I know what Jeff said. Why didn't I use quad NR? Um, we, we, in Dialog has a quad NR, which gives you a vector of vectors, so I could have made this go faster. But th this looks at, so this is this function with the comments removed. It works, hey! Yeah? Um, and do, just to show you, the, the four pick of the, if they, okay Jeff? Yep. Happy? <laughs> the, um, the four pick is counting for zero, I mean index one, so I'm actually going to try it on this line just to check that um, that, uh, oh, this, what this is saying is do it on that line to make sure we don't lose this. And also notice that it's removed the trailing <coughs> blanks, so that's the whole, uh, the whole thing. So that's, that looks good to ship. Uh, right, now what I want to do now is to show you the... Uh, let me see if I can... Yeah. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, let me do this again. Uh, quad VR... Room some. So we've got that on the screen, and I'm going to edit. I, ha I have only two functions in my workspace: room cum and if you, if you apply the inverse of that, so you decide what comments you should have on your phone. Put, <laughs> put them back in again. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Do we try it? <laughs> I, that's one of those questions where you say, talk to me in the bar afterwards. I, yeah. All right. So, the, and I just want to uh, compare. The, wearing my functional programming hat now, this is how I would write this function. So it's the same algorithms, nothing has changed, but the, ine the immediate thing is to run your eyes down the comments, and these tend to be uncommented is, uh, I guess, an adjective, is it? It's an uncommented line of APL. <clears throat> These tend to be nouns. Uh, the, so the, the re this is uh, a function that gives you the unquoted charts, a function that gives you the uncommented lines without leading blanks. So it's not saying do this, do this, do this. It's actually telling you what the result is. And the functional way of writing this program, or a functional way of writing this program, is to define a number of little functions each of which do a little job, and then I can combine them in the last line <coughs> to do the whole thing. Now, one of the uh, interesting points, the first time I heard about functional programming, when the very early research was done, yeah, you can see how old this story is. This must have been in the... This must have been in the mid-70s, early 70s to mid-70s, <coughs> Somebody, I was a Fortran programmer, and somebody told me that the academics were working on languages in which you could shuffle the cards, your source cards, and the program would still run. <laughs> which, as a Fortran programmer, was a ridiculous thing to say. But actually, this, I can shuffle those three lines around because they're definitions, and, and, and that is absolutely true. Okay, so, that, so the thing is, these things are independent. Whereas in this example, I'm developing the steps one by one. And if I start doing work on this, I have to be very careful of the dependencies between the lines. <clears throat> and one of the quotes, uh, uh, when, when you're reading this, you say, first do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. The word then appears. The language you use to describe procedural programming is temporal. Whereas functional programs, there's a, there's a famous quote which says, 
functional programmers, functional programs have, have no notion of the passing of time. They just describe what is. So, for example, I feel much more, what could I do? I could do a whole bunch of stuff with this. Um, well, one of the things I can do, uh, I, I can certainly change this stuff. Well, maybe I should just run this and see if it works first. Uh, that'd be good, wouldn't it? So I can do the, let me do the uncomment. Well, I'm so glad that worked. So that that uh, that works. But I can um, I can certainly change these things around. I can. Well, let me just do this. I can't change that one. Hang on. Why can't I change that one? No, that's a fun. No, no, it's it's fine. It's okay because it's not. Um, it's okay. Let me let me let's. We're living on the edge. I can't put it below the last one, so there's still this. Okay. So let's see if that still works. So defense are flawed. Defense are flawed, yes. Okay. And I can do things like I'm quite happy to take, um, uh, what have we got, WLB. Well, I'm quite happy to take that guy out. Uh, hang on. Take him out and take him out. And glue a on either side of this guy, I think. Is this We're living on the edge a bit here, but you should rename it though if you do that. Very good. Very good. Yeah? Trim. Or yeah, trim. Call it trim. Well that's a that's a that's a trans what, I, what I'm prepared to call it is trimmed. Yeah? yeah. I've, um, somebody's pointed out recently that <clears throat> a lot of the people in um, our community are on the edge of um, OCD people. And this is not o uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. This program is not OCD compliant because that doesn't line up with that. <laughs> and that so now, it, okay, let's just take a risk. And it still works, yeah? <clears throat> yeah, okay, so we can argue about the, the word, but um, the, the, the trick to. Uh, Oh, okay. No, it's not quite as easy as that. Or under, the under. If we had an under, Roger could do it with his under. So um, WLB could be this under reverse. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Should we try it? No, but it's uh, okay. Let's have a go. And the point is that if you write programs in such a way, um, because you've got little building blocks, you can massage them and move bits to and fro. I think that's the, uh, that's the example. Yeah? They're called components. Components, not program. They're components. Okay. So that's what I wanted to show you. Thank you. So, Roger, you're on. <coughs> tell you my shameless plug, uh, which is, if you like the key operator, you should talk to Morton. <laughs> he's, open to, he's open to various forms of persuasion. <laughs> so 
I'm going to talk about uh, the, some operators in APL that I, that I call combinators. So remember the quote I had at the beginning, a system is composed of components, and a component is something you understand. And FP specifies rules for the interface between components. So I was thinking, trying to think of ex solid examples of in real life that can be used to demonstrate combinators. So the first thing that popped into my head is a system located near the Bramley office, the dialogue Bramley office. Uh, but as, on second thought, it's not such a good example. You, you see some errors have crept into the interface. <laughs> and I wouldn't say the components are something you understand because People have been trying to understand these things for 4,000 years. So, and then I thought of something else. And uh, in, order, in honor of Morten and Gitta, who are from Denmark, <laughs> give you the other excellent Danish export. So how do, how do uh, Lego blocks stack up? Well, as you can see, there's, there's not, nothing haphazard about the interface. It's uh, very well defined, very carefully defined. And uh, are the components something you understand? Charles play. So I'm John, I see black. Uh. <laughs> so I'm going to adapt the, uh, this, these uh, components and, and rules to describe combinators. So the black bricks uh, would be the left argument. The colored bricks would be uh, functions. And the white bricks would be the right argument. So alpha is the left argument, and omega is the right argument. So when you have one brick going into another brick, then it's the monadic application of the brick or the function. And when you have two bricks going into one, then it's the dyadic application of the function. Okay. So one combinator is the compose operator one function after the other, f on g on omega. That's a binary case. Um, this is the one that uh, conventional mathematics talk about all the time, f of g of h of i of j of k and so on. And it's one of the underappreciated contributions of Ken that you have to do something about dyadic functions, because they give you more, many more possibilities of comp composition and combining. So in the dyadic case, uh, uh, for compose, the definition is this. You know, f on the left argument, and f on the right argument, and then you combine the result with There's another one that we talked, we saw earlier that's called under. It's the same as the what the previous slide, except at the end you apply the inverse function, the transparent uh, blue brick. And if you want to see, this is a very useful concept, under. Um, useful for thinking about problems. Of an excellent tool of thought. And in this JWiki essay, there are about 100 examples of uh, under. I'm 
Another uh, combinator is the operator called a top. So in the monad case, it's the same as the uh, compose. But in the dyadic case, you, you apply the blue to the black and white, and then you apply the red to it. Whereas the, uh, with the other compose, you can just tell that it's a fatter composition. You notice the, the two-year gap between the, the definition of this. This is the first presented, as far as I can tell, in 1980, whereas uh, <coughs> this composition was defined in 1978. So Ken does work slow, but he produces good results. <laughs> And then uh, nine years later, came up with four. So here's the system summary. Monadic and dyadic. Composition, duality or under, a top, and fork. Over to you, John. I think we just take a bow because uh, I think that's it. It's a summary. But it, is, it would be interesting if people have questions or discussions or. If you want any personal advice or anything like that, we're, we're here to, um, to help. Otherwise, we can all go and go to that. Bob, yeah. Um, just a comment on, on the two programming styles from the standpoint of, of somebody who's interested in a static analysis of programs and compilation. If you, if you have a, a procedural uh, language, uh, there tend to be side effects involved. If line gets this, do something to the line, do something to the line, and so on. It's very hard for a human or a computer to understand what's going on. And it's very and the analysis, although there's tools that, that can make this stuff easier, uh, uh, trying to find out whether your program has any errors in it through computerized analysis of is fairly difficult. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a functional language, um, all those things become become very clear. And uh, for example, in in, in a in, op in an optimizer, you might want to say, well, gee, can I? I've got these two operations on like line there. Can I do them at the same time? Very sophisticated analysis may let you do that, mm -hmm. but in general, a, a compiler will have to be conservative and say, well, I don't I don't know what's going on here. We'll have to do it the slow way. Yeah. With a functional language. Essentially, what you're doing is creating new objects. Logically, you're creating new objects all along, although you never do it in practice. Mm -hmm. But the analysis then becomes very straightforward, and any side effects that may occur within the computation are introduced by the compiler itself, and it knows precisely what those side effects are. As a result, you could gen you can generate functional code that should outperform anything you can do with the conventional. Yes. Uh, <coughs> yes, I, I'd like to. Uh, I mean, I have a comment on this. Do you want to? Do you have a um, Where's Jay? Is Jay in the room? Where is Jay? Jay, front row. Um, Jay is doing some. Uh, Jay Fode is doing some work in dialogue to take uh, subsets of the language, and he's starting with D funds, um, and doing uh, expression transformation on the. Uh, on this code, and in particular, um, if you if a function is written in a in a series of definitions f uh, 
followed by uh, an expression using those definitions, you can do a lot of work of removing intermediate results, removing intermediate naming. Um, you can produce uh, expression trees. So the, the purity um, helps, the writing in a functional style helps J. So please <coughs> write in a functional style uh, to do that. Um, there was another thing I was going to uh, uh, respond. Uh, oh, yeah, the other thing that, um, about uh, what I didn't show in, in the examples I put up was um, also, uh, I mean, the, the procedural program I wrote was really quite a nice procedural program because it was just line, 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 bang. It didn't have any loops or go-tos or um, those sort of things in it. And again, if you have branches, um, that uh, makes it very difficult for compilers. Um, and the other thing I've heard about functional languages, um, we, uh, as a C programmer, and uh, C is a procedural language, um, when I write loops, I tend to go around one too many or one too few times, <laughs> all the time. And I think Carlo Alberto said, uh, I remember you saying that at one of the conferences, that writing APL is easy, you type it in, and if, uh, if the answer doesn't work, you subtract one, and, try, and, then, and then it's okay. But um, uh, functional languages like Defense tend to suffer from that. Uh, uh, Defense, you don't have loops, and you don't tend to get into an equivalent um, problem. And the functional programmers say that uh, a lot of those problems just disappear because you've got a, a restricted, you've got a very much simpler um, mechanism, infrastructure for your expressions. Uh, yeah. So that's it. yeah. The, the uncomfortable thing about the functional style of programming seems to be that you're naming the, I mean, in that example, you're mm -hmm. naming the lines of code, and when I later need to understand how the program works, I have to go <coughs> and look up, you know, the program flow is, could be convoluted. You have to say, Oh, I call this, what's that? Oh, that's that thing over there. And whereas in, in the procedural one, it's, you know, do yeah. this, do this, do this, yeah. do this, and you can... Yeah. When you trace through it, it, it goes down the line. The time was in the other one, it's going ding, 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 all over the place. And it's harder <coughs> mentally. Yeah. It's easy there where you put four, where you've got three names up. up. But if you yeah. were to write a, a large application yeah. in that style, you would end up with... 700 differently named snippets yeah. of code. <clears throat> okay, well again, I could, should I, do you have a brief? All right. What if you maintain a The, the, if, um, when, I can yeah. find. when we did defense, we, <coughs> um, uh, it was based on the technology that we, we had just enough technology at the time. We just introduced control structures, um, and Jeff, uh, did a lot of work on that, uh, on the scanning at the lexical phase of control structures and Jeff provided just enough technology to allow the in fact the curly braces in defense if you look very hard through an electron microscope they are actually control structures um, because the the interpreter needs to know to jump to and from matching braces so the defense were would, would the best and they're mostly my fault, but the best we could think of at the time to fit in. And it's like saying, um, you know, to the Wright brothers, wouldn't it have been better if you'd used a jet engine in the uh, plane? The technology wasn't available there. Now, if I had another crack at doing that, given today's technology, one of the things I'd be very tempted to do with defense is to write them upside down. And what that would be is, that at the moment, the definition of a defense is, a, is an expression preceded by definitions used in the expression. And what I'd like to do is to write a, a defense where you give the expression with using definitions, and then you say where, and then you write sub-expressions, and, and I'd use indentation to localise sub-expressions within sub-expressions and within sub-expressions. And what this means is that you can, in that style, you can read the top expression, and if you're happy with that, fine. But if you need any detail, you just drill down the definitions as far as you want. And that's a more declarative way of uh, doing. So the mean program would say sum divided by num, where, 
If you just understand them like that, you, you give up. But if you want to know what a sum means, where a sum is plus five shirt, you go. Um, so that's, uh, that's um, I know uh, some of the functional languages are like that, they call them where. Yeah, but if you're reading current sequence, you, you, you're going down a bit, and yeah. then you go up a bit, and then you come down yeah. and up, and it's a little Yeah. Well, the defunds are slightly complicated by having the guard, but if you have a guardless defund, the trick is to read them bottom up, read the expression at the bottom first, and then figure out uh, what you need. Yeah, but it's, it's a valid point, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's only multi line defunds that are <coughs> unpleasant because they go from top to bottom. Yes, yes, okay, that's a fair point. Flora, did you have a question? Yes. Just, uh, I just wondered if you were asleep. I just, <laughs> just, thought, just thought I'd embarrass you. Yeah, sorry. I guess the only thing that struck me about the part of the presentation, I mean, it was very good, but are you saying that the defunds paradigm is contributing to better towards functional programming? Because you could have really written that same last line in functions that you could have defined in a standard way. Yeah, oh, yes. Now, no, there, there was a bit of so, sleight of hand there. So, one thing that I haven't really seen much mention of that I've actually embraced quite a bit in dialogue and I haven't seen much mention of it yet in the conference, but I'd love to speak to other people that are heavily into it, is the object-oriented paradigm. I personally believe is that delivers a lot more leverage than, than what we've just seen. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. I did not, I struggled for years and years and years to understand what the object-oriented paradigm was. I found it, I'm, I found it very, very, very difficult. I, I couldn't get my head around it. The functional paradigm, I, I've been very interested in since the early 80s, and um, there's a W.B. Yates quote about being sick with desire. I became sick with desire about... Uh, functional programming um, and I couldn't get my head around um, object oriented programming until quite recently on YouTube um, Stanford University do a series of computer science lectures I can't remember, I'm sure you can search YouTube um, and they're an introduction to programming paradigms and one of them was fu the functional programming paradigm and one of them was the object paradigm and the what made it click for me after all these years of trying was if you have a system where you are trying to um, uh, let me think produce to say what something is if, it's an, uh, if, you, if you can ask a what is question what is the next move in this game of chess what is the fuel burn to land this satellite on the surface of the planet what is the best investment I can make? Those, the answers to those questions, tend, you can tend to answer those with functional programming. And the thing in the Stanford lectures that brought it home to me was that sometimes we want to use a computer to represent state. And an example of that was if you're doing simulations where you're representing, if you're designing a roundabout system like Adrian's, and you want to model cars, and that each of the cars has velocity, you're, it's, it's, it's not really a what is thing. You're, you, you, you want to represent state in this computer. And my understanding is that as soon as you start wanting to represent state, then natural selection will lead you inevitably towards the OO paradigm, and the inheritance and the classes and all of that. It comes from the single act of representing state. And it depends on your, what your application is doing. If you're, if you're doing things that are uh, maybe a banking system when you want to represent state, then you're going to be pushed along that way. But as a functional programming bigot, um, I, um, I assert that we, even within the object paradigm, there are nice areas that can be represented as state-free. Some of the calculations you do, what's the, uh, the mortgage repayment for this... Uh, you know, for if I've got a loan of this much and the interest is this much, the mortgage repayment is, a, is an expression is is, uh, is functional. So that you can mix them, 
Um, and that's, that's, uh, that's why I'm, there was a lot of hand waving in that. Um, but that's, uh, yes, the, the, they're quite different. They're, the object paradigm and the functional paradigm attempt to solve quite different problems. Well, I mean, I'll give you an example in real life. You probably know my friend Stanley Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Absolutely, um, absolutely, and that strikes me as a. <clears throat> uh, I am not very good at representing the. I've only recently understood a glimmer of the object oriented uh, paradigm. There are many people in this room who are much more comfortable in that and, and can explain that than I do. In your example, I can see how that would be, uh, how that would be true, yes. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in this little bit of. Uh, the, the example I, I, <clears throat> I suppose I like to, I'm not sure if this is relevant here, but the example everybody trots out about APL is the expression for the mean of a vector, which is plus slash omega divide rho omega. And, and that is, there are no moving parts in that. It doesn't get much simpler. There are no objects involved here. That's a functional program. Um, and it's an, the thing about that is it's an expression. Um, and once you are in the world of expressions, you can do very nice, um, Rod, Roger's example of, of making little component expressions, and they join together very nicely. I, I'm sure the same is, prob is true of uh, object paradigm, but I'm not qualified to, uh, to judge that. Well, I see this as a component. I mean, I, I really value you know, what you presented here, and I think that, that using this methodology inside your classes yeah. Well, we, we're two minutes into drinking time, I think, so uh, <coughs> if there are no more questions, maybe we should carry this discussion on in a speakeasy. Yep.